Hello, everybody. Welcome to another video interview with the Sales Pro. I'd like to introduce you to Jeff Summers with the EI Academy. Jeff is a managing partner of the EI Academy and has been in professional sales since 1985. And for the last 25 years, he has been working with professional employee assessments. Hey, welcome to the show, Jeff. Thanks, Michael. Thank you for, for having me here. It's great to have you. I've known you for a few years now and have always enjoyed our relationship. And we've had a lot of conversations around sales. And so I'm looking forward to uh, today's chat. Absolutely. Absolutely. So the first thing that I want to start with, Jeff, though, is to better understand the EI Academy. For those out there that are watching this video uh, who don't know you, would you please tell us a little bit about the EI Academy and what you do there? Yeah, Michael, and I'll give you a short, quick overview because we'll get into the emotional intelligence and some more stories and analogies. But, um, you know, Debbie and I um, are operate the EI Academy. So what we do is we're a distributor in North America for Genos International, which is out of Australia. So what we do here in North America, Michael, is we have individuals that are coaches and trainers and consultants that are looking at using these tools and assessments and trainings out of Genos International in Australia. So again, we work with individual coaches and trainers and consultants that are looking to add this to their mix that they're already doing so they can go out and do their intervention by adding the emotional intelligence component to their um, offerings. Excellent. And as a full disclosure to the people watching the video, I am a uh, Genos International uh, authorized distributor here in uh, Northern California. And that's how I got to meet Jeff and Debbie, his lovely wife. Uh, but let's get to the topic of sales, Jeff, because I, I really want to have this conversation with you today. So what is it about sales that interests you so much? Well, oh, you know, it's interesting. And I go back to 1985, 84, when I was a senior in college, Michael, I had gotten the book, um, How to Win Friends and Influence People, which I think was copyrighted back in like 1936 or 35. And I read that. I read it again. I read it again. I read it again. And sales is interesting. I know now the world of sales is changing where people are getting degrees in marketing and, and business management through sales. Back in those days, there really were no tracks in college that led directly to sales. I had an advertising marketing background, but that book, How to Win Friends and Influence People, I just, I, it was, I, I just kind of almost memorized, it's almost like I memorized it. And it was one of those things. I think there was a person who had a quote that, that which you think about you become so I graduate college in 84, 85, and um, knew I wanted to get into marketing, did some, some work through an advertising. But once I got into sales, and again, coming back to how to win friends and influence people, which was really emotional intelligence before we had emotional intelligence. Mm -hmm. But it was really, I love sales because it's great to find a passion and all that great stuff. But when you learn how people react when you treat them well and when you connect with them and you make them feel appreciated and valued and heard and all those things that again we refer to as interpersonal skills now we refer to them as emotional intelligence but it's that extra that other piece to the sales process that got me into it but again i just there's that competitive side love to be around people love to find a product or service or something that I'm passionate about, then you add the emotional intelligence in and nothing happens, Michael, as you know, until something is sold. So um, kind of in a roundabout way, that's kind of how I got into it. But um, for me, at least when I've been, when I've done well, I've been behind a great organization and a great product and a great service. And when I've struggled over the years, it's because I didn't feel like I had was a good fit. Interesting. Uh, you, you, you brought up that uh, that book, How to Win Friends and Influence People, written by Dale Carnegie many years ago. It's going to get to 100 years old here pretty soon. I know. And uh, that book actually represented a breakthrough for me, too, coincidentally, in, uh, in 1998, when I started as a marketing manager at Oracle. Mm -hmm. I needed help. I needed help with presenting, with leading meetings, leading teams, and I just felt like I needed some sort of boost and I took the Dale Carnegie signature course. And that's when I first read the book. And I had a breakthrough by going through that material in that 12 week program. So it's interesting. And we also have a parallel in marketing and advertising. I received an advertising degree from Arizona State and was very interested in advertising, but then ended up getting into sales. Yeah. So it, it's funny how we have some parallels in our lives, Jeff. 
All right, Jeff. So then when it comes to EI and sales, what role do you think EI plays in the sales process? I think there's a lot of areas and we could go on forever, but I think that maybe the best thing is, is to take you back to a story that was back in 1989 that was before we called EI, but I think it will resonate. And um, it was a time where I was getting ready, Michael, to buy my first new car. Mm. I was not a car person, so my brother Bruce took me out. We had three different dealerships we were going to look at. And we went to the first car dealership and it was, you know, okay, nothing memorable. I didn't buy a vehicle. I went to the second place and um, again, nothing memorable and either good nor bad. I went to the third place. It was in Rock Island, Illinois, a place called Campbell Olds. I can see it. I can see the salesperson, Mark. And I was actually looking at a Cutlass Supreme 1989. And at that time, that was right when the electronic miles per hour kind of stuff and things were getting more computerized. Mm -hmm. And Mark and I and my brother Bruce were going through some things and all was pleasant. He knew his stuff. But near the very end of the, of, of the appointment, Mark said, and I'll never forget it. And it was a big piece coming back to your question about EI playing a part in sales. He said, I don't know if you're going to purchase a vehicle here or not. That's up to you. But because there's so many things going on with these new computers for all of us, and we've had a few glitches here and there, just in case you do, I'd love to introduce you to Gary in our service department. Look at our service department because things happen and it's just the way it is. Nothing is perfect. And I went in and met Gary. Well, that was the car I ended up buying. So long story short, circling back, that was way before the term emotional intelligence really came into play. But that was, as we refer to, and you know this, it was very authentic. Now we look back, very authentic and someone being very open and honest about a possible mistake that is going on. But emotion is emotion and, and human evolution and all those things going, Michael. I bought the third car. And at that time, I didn't, you know, we didn't have MRIs and neuroscience. But as time went on, I really always thought back to that story. And it was a very specific, small story, but it always resonated. And to this day, that was really a story that, again, coming back to your original question about EI and sales, that is the, the part of it that he made me feel good, number one. But I also saw somebody that wasn't trying to overdo it and was willing to show we've got some shortcomings, but here's what we're going to do about it. Does that answer your question? It sure does. I mean, there's there's actually a, a lot in that little story, Jeff. One one is that uh, you mentioned that the salesperson Mark he he knew his stuff, right? And and, and that's important. That EI is not a panacea or a no. magic bullet to make more sales. It will certainly enhance and improve your process, but you still need to know your stuff. Right. Two, you know that there's competition out there. Mark knew that there's a chance that you've met someone else at another dealership, and you might just better connect with that person. And yet he wanted to be vulnerable and authentic and transparent and recognize the reality of the situation and still want to help you by inviting you to meet the sales manager. I mean, the service manager. Yeah. And that reminds me of the book written by Bob Berg and John David Mann, The Go-Giver, where in that book, Joe, the salesperson, learns that by giving of himself and not necessarily just to make a sale, that you may actually improve and enhance your future success. And so, so it reminds me of that. I think it's an excellent story, Jeff, that really, really highlights the role of EI in sales. So, so then, Jeff, I, I personally obviously believe in EI, uh, but I, I have a tough question to ask you that I think some people are thinking as they're watching this. Can a salesperson be successful and meet their goals without EI? Wow, great question. My first thought is... <laughs> In, in this day and age, and I think 20 or 30 or 40 years ago and beyond, when a salesperson had all the control, had all the information, and they had to be able to walk in. But now with the internet and everything going on, I think of Dan Pink, and, and there's that whole discussion around as we walk in and meet with our people and whatever product or service that we're bringing and a solution, they're, Michael, in a much better situation. They have information. Sometimes they have pricing and all of a sudden the control moves. So I'm going to answer that question. I think it's very difficult in a non-transactional sale. So meaning if it's a person working at a kiosk at the mall or one call close and um, maybe a different kind of item in a retail environment, yeah, maybe possibly 
I'm not sure how they're going to get along with their with their teammates and the people they work with. But I think in any kind of consultative um, business to business kind of where it's multiple calls, multiple appointments, and you've got to earn the trust. I just think that in most of the sales that we do in professional sales, when the first call really is about just getting to know and get comfortable with someone, if you don't have it and that organization has choices, I don't think you're going to get a second call back. If you got the only product, the only service, and you happen to be with them and they need you, but your question really was around, is that person successful? I'm going to say in professional B2B sales, in my opinion, very difficult. Maybe in a retail, in a transactional sale, they could get by. Um, that's just my opinion. Yeah. Yeah, inter interesting. And and uh, I often talk about the role of of the salesperson today being consultative. If you still want to have a job, you know yeah. that that I think the internet is largely replacing transactional selling, and therefore the the salespeople that are needed by companies are consultative salespeople. And uh, and I do believe that that layer of EI blended in with other abilities to connect with people, establish rapport, follow a process, be disciplined and diligent. You know, there's a lot of, lot of reasons why salespeople succeed, but without EI, it's, it's, it's uh, definitely uh, going to be more difficult. I, I would agree with you about that, Jeff. What do you think can happen when salespeople don't have EIs? I don't have a second chance. If I don't make a good, if I don't make you feel right and connected, like I'm listening and part of that process, Again, unless you need that product and that's the only one, but if you have choices and I'm not making a connection to make you feel good, it's going to be difficult. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, in, in the world that we live in, there are almost always choices. Yeah, exactly. it, it is extremely unusual these days for a salesperson to be selling something and it's the only way you can get that product. I mean, of course, if you're, if you're buying a Boeing jet, well, only Boeing sells Boeing jets. Right, but uh, there aren't a lot of products out there in the marketplace today where you can only buy it from, and you and you could even buy it from a different salesperson, right? So just because you can only get a Boeing jet from Boeing doesn't mean that you have to buy it from a specific salesperson. Right. So that's that's the other thing to keep in mind, right? So then we're living in a in a tough time for salespeople now, Jeff, where they generally have to try and make a connection in a virtual setting, just like right now uh, we're we're doing this interview over Zoom. And, uh, and of course, that's for other reasons, because I want to share it with the world. And so we're going to do it virtually like this and record it and make it, make it available. But for a salesperson, trying to make a connection with a prospect in a virtual world, how can EI play a role there? Can, do you have any, any ideas or tips? Um, I think it's just about, Michael, being aware of what you're nervous about, possibly having that self-awareness and putting together a plan to not try to um, not try to circumvent it, but just be transparent, just say, I'm new to this stuff here. If you find, you know, if I look down, here's what I'm looking at. Whatever you're thinking about on the front end, I don't think it's a problem just to share that with people and let them know you're real. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's, that's a big challenge. You know, that, that I know that um, there are many salespeople who want to be, presenting a picture of being completely put together. I'm totally dialed in. I'm on top of it. I don't have any flaws or vulnerabilities. You know, I'm the perfect person to do business with. And you're actually suggesting something fairly different that it's okay to reveal that you have some flaws. And Go back to 1989, 1989, you know, human nature. I felt much more comfortable with somebody who did have a degree of a vulnerability that, Hey, we've had some problems just in case here, you know, he took a negative and turned a positive. So it was 1989. I felt more comfortable with someone who was being, we didn't call it vulnerability at the time. Right. That's just how it is. And I think there's, um, there's a quote out there, remember, but people don't trust perfect. Mm, interesting. I never, I never heard that before. Uh, people, people don't trust perfect. It does, it does make you wonder what's, actually behind that that veil of perfection right i don't i don't i don't know that it, i want to call it a facade but maybe a, a veil or aura of perfection that that we we all uh have something behind that that veneer of perfection yeah so why not just be authentic and uh, an expressive vulnerability or two 
And you've done you've done that even though right, I've been doing it forever. Right? I do it, did it before. It's just how I am it's just easier. It's a lot of stress if you're like, and I'll just share one quick story. I think is a is a it was a, a probably 1997, Michael. I was in Reno, Nevada for a John Deere show. It was the middle of winter. I grew up with us a lot of bloody noses. Mm. And I woke up one morning to do, I had like five 15 minute um, classrooms of like 60, 70 people in the class. And I woke up with the, one of the worst bloody noses. It was dry. I could not get it to stop. I was so freak. I was freaking out a little bit. Yeah. So my, again, I'm on stage. So I get up on the first one and I don't know why I, I didn't plan it, but I said to the group, I said, before I get started, I woke up this morning with a really, really bad bloody nose and I've got tissues in my pocket. And if, if I get a bloody nose, you're going to have a story for a lifetime that you actually went and saw and talked to somebody who was up in front of you, but had a bloody nose. What it did is it took all the pressure off of me. If I had one, I had one. But for the next three days, people were coming by like, hey, it was, how's your nose? And, and in a strange way, it wasn't, it was more for me to get that anxiety off and say, you know what, if it happens, it happens. But I found that the people that were there, the John Deere dealers that would be my customers seemed to really it resonate. And that was 1996. These are John Deere dealers and service technicians and parts managers and owners. And, and uh, what I'm getting from that is when you're more human, that allows the other person to be more human too. You know, yeah. if we need to be perfect, then it's kind of somehow putting some pressure on them that they need to be perfect as well for, you know, you may just be exuding that vibe. Um, Let me so just share one thing in that area. I'm going to interrupt you here. When, when we're in a sales call mm -hmm. and we open up and share, and if I'm calling on you and I'm a little bit vulnerable and I drop my guard and pull some of that body armor as Brene Brown talks about, and I'm asking you questions and asking you to share with me. If I'm willing to open up and be a little bit more vulnerable, as Brene talks about, guess what? All of a sudden, you start to get there. But if I've got my, my body armor on, everything's perfect, and I'm asking you questions, I'm, ask, I'm providing surface level um, information. You're probably going to provide surface level information. So in the world of sales, it's about trust. And when someone gives, someone else is willing to give. And I think it works, the ability to gather real information where under the surface level, that's where things, that's where the knowledge is, but they just don't give it to anybody. You've got to show up a certain way. Yeah. Yeah. I remember seeing um, a presentation from Mark Hunter you know, he's called the sales hunter. And in that presentation, Mark said that when the prospect shares something with you that is proprietary now you've established trust Great and one. intimacy and you will get nowhere with that prospect until you establish trust and intimacy. And so this is what I see as a great value of EI is that it's going to get you to that level of trust and intimacy faster than without it. So then Jeff, the, the final question, which is the golden question, right? Maybe the, the hardest question for some salespeople watching this video or I, I also get people who are business owners that need to sell in order to move their business forward. How can you raise your level of EI? If you know that EI doesn't come naturally to you, how can you raise it and take advantage of EI? Uh, and when I say take advantage, I don't mean that in a negative way, but you know, incorporate it like, like you, you do, like I do, like some other people do. How? Uh, they call it Michael Neuendorf. Um, I think Michael, like anything else, and you've been around, we have an exercise that we, that EI experience. I think anything that we can do because for people that are not used to it, you know, emotional, you know, the whole leave your emotions at the door. But I think there's some exercises just to warm people up and get them used to it because I think people have to do it. But I think the EI experience that we do and we have been doing and it's been done all over the world is one great exercise to do where it gets somebody in the middle of their best and worst. So I think the first step is, is maybe get away from some of the academic stuff and, and using terms that are academic and just really breaking it down. But I think the EI experience, whether it's the sales version or the other version, 
is a way for people to pick their burst and, and they're going through and they're rating how they feel, their engagement score, the whole pick up the phone. But I think that's a good first step to get people a little bit engaged with what it is at a level that is very real to them. Um, I think even reading books on emotional intelligence are nice, but I think is the best way is to get them engaged in some kind of exercise that allows them to experience it with real people from best and worst on their end. And it's very specific, but I think that's a great way to get them engaged and say, you know what, I get it. Where do we go from here? And then we can peel the onion back. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, what Jeff is referring to, you know, the EI experience, it's uh, often presented at the beginning of a presentation on emotional intelligence to help the crowd to gain an understanding. Mm -hmm. You know, for example, think of the best boss you ever had. What made them the best boss? And think of the worst boss you ever had. What made them the worst boss? You know, and there's typically certain characteristics about the way they conducted themselves and behaved with you that made you feel a certain way. And then when you uh, superimpose yourself, are you, what's the best version of yourself and how are you making other people feel, right? Really start thinking about that more deeply and uh, becoming more and more self-aware. You know, Gary V uh, once said that uh, self-awareness is uh, the most difficult and yet the most valuable thing that he's working on is to increase his self-awareness, right? Because he really believes that it's a master skill to improve human relations. And that's a core part of emotional intelligence. So, hey, you got, you got me going off on a little mini lecture hey, here. I'll Jeff. tell you what. You, that was A plus because that was dead on. That was awesome. That well, was thank very, you. very thank well you. done. <laughs> I, I, lo I love the topic, right? We've been talking for a while because I love the topic and we could talk, talk a lot longer, but then uh, people are probably going to want a part two of the video instead of <laughs> staying on. With it. So we may have to come back to this another All time. All right. Great, yeah, great. It's been terrific talking with you today. Um, I so appreciate the work that you and Debbie are doing at the EI Academy and I appreciate that you accepted this invitation to just talk about the role of EI in sales. Thank you so much. Thank you. And we appreciate you too, Michael. Thank you very much. And thanks for the opportunity um, to share a few stories. Appreciate it. Yeah, you're very welcome. And, uh, and I will have uh, uh, Jeff's contact information in uh, comments so you can learn more about Jeff and Debbie and what they're doing at the EI Academy. And of course, you can always connect with me at any time. All right. And that's it for today. Thank you very much.